thing I really specifically wanted to hone in on um, in terms of thinking about different demands that people have made, even going back to then, right, is, uh, is that uh, pain, as I understand it, is essentially, and I'm sure you can disambiguate this, right, you know, but like in, in a sense, right, you know, is, is like a early advocate of something that is in some ways analogous to like a universal basic income. Can you speak on that? Yeah, I and the reason I, I, I pull back for two reasons yeah, when I hear that. Yeah. The one, as I to recall our dear friend Michael, is is I would say yeah. that Michael said, Well, what about this Andrew Wang universal basic mm -hmm. income? What about what would Payne say? And this came up when I was on Rising, yeah. uh, Crystal wanted to know. And I said, I, I said, I'm not gonna deny that one could derive an argument for universal basic income from Thomas Paine's arguments. But I think it's really, I think it's to avoid what Thomas Paine was really arguing for. Mm. I mean, Thomas Paine was the father of social democracy. And in the pamphlet, first of all, in his two volume pamphlet, Rights of Man, he moves decidedly in favor of social democracy. And what it, because he says that if we can get rid of, because he's now back in England for a while, if we can get rid of the monarchy and the aristocracy, and all think of the wealth that will be saved and think of the things we can do to attack poverty and lift up working people. <clears throat> but the other thing is, and this is even more important, in agrarian justice written a few, a, a few years later in the 1790s, Thomas Paine actually says that, and he was a deist, not an atheist. As a deist, he believed God had created the universe and the, and the earth and that it was, he offered the creation as something we all had a share in. That is all we're to share in that. And as a consequence, those who have come to monopolize the land, and keep in mind land and agriculture were the fundamentals in the late 18th century, those who come to occupy and own, you know, possess all this land, they owe, they owe us a payment. They owe us a tax. They owe not just an individual uh, kind of payment, but they own the, the entire community or, or nation a payment. So he said, what needs to happen is we need, is we need to create a, a, a fund, call it mm. community trust in the monopoly game version or a national treasury. And the taxes to be paid into there should be used, should be used for two kinds of projects or two kinds of programs, better said. One, every young person, and Payne was a feminist or at least mm. a proto-feminist. He had been cl very close to Mary Wollstonecraft during the years of the, of the French Revolution. She was very much inspired by him. He said, we should make sure that every young person, whether man, man or woman, boy or girl, on reaching the age of maturity should be given a grant, a sum of money, which would enable them you know, to get an education or to buy land themselves or to set up in a business. That way you prevent poverty, period, okay? And then he said, There's, the other part of that fund should be used for the purpose of what, in the 1930s or 20s, they called old age pensions. We came, we come to know as social security. And he's basically saying when, when people reach the age of, he didn't use the word retirement, 55, whatever it might be, that they should be uh, given money so that they can live co comfortably. So Payne is a social democrat. Okay, he didn't argue for dispossessing the landed, although I read a really good argument several years ago that said that Payne was really sort of saying, do this landed, landed folks, or we're going to come for your land next. Right. Okay. So in any case, so he's a social Democrat. Now, the, the other part of the problem with UBI is that, mm. as I remember saying to Michael, was that I can readily imagine, speaking of landed people, that landlords would immediately grab hold of the, the UBI payment by raising their rents on people. Right, 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 right. 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 So it should be the case that what we're talking, it should be a kind of social democratic thing. And by the way, I mean, social democracy today, we can readily imagine, for example, I mean, think about taking Payne's ideas and expanding. So everyone's talked about Medicare for all and the Democrats like Biden are doing the wimpy version of it. Well, we'll reduce the age of Medicare from what, 65 to 60. But how about if we say that everyone under the age of 18 has free health care? Let's start there. That would be to combat poverty at the beginning and to enable people at the beginning. I mean, I'm a, I, look, I'd go for Medicare. I don't even know if I'd w stay at Medicare for all. I like to think of it something called all American health care. We're all yeah, covered. Like, we pay our taxes and we don't have to worry. Okay. Like, like the, like Britain's NHS, that kind of thing. Exactly. Having lived in England, I could, I don't know if you've been, ever lived over there, but living right. over there was when I went to the dentist, it was taken care of. When I got mononucleosis, 
it was taken care of. Yeah, I haven't I haven't lived there, but my uh, my my sister um, is is married to a British guy, and she's she's lived there for many years. You know, and I've I've certainly been over to visit, uh, and and yeah, I mean, there's 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 something that's incredibly liberating about um, you know, living in that system, having the NHS card, knowing that like you're never going to be charged, or I mean, really, the only you know. Like even now, right? Like the you know, with 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 all of the uh, inroads, you know, from from Thatcher through New Labour, you know, to to Boris Johnson, all the inroads into that system and all the chipping away at it. Uh, even now, right? Like uh, the only the only money you're actually going to be charged in NHS hospitals for parking, and uh, Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn's Labour Party, uh, you know, when he was leading it, at least, you know, I don't, I don't know if they still are, but. Um, what if their election demands was to abolish the parking fees, you know, because you shouldn't even, <laughs> you shouldn't even have that, right? That Imagine be, having yeah. that be your problem. But uh, I, I guess one thread I, I did want to con connect there, yeah, right? Sorry, when you're yeah. talking about, uh, you know, Thomas Paine, you know, kind of as a proto-social Democrat uh, in his support for various kinds of redistribution, you know, um, like something like social security and so on. Uh, and I, I think making some very perceptive points about the problems with like Yang style UBI proposals. Um, and actually I'd even add into that another problem with, with those proposals is that most of what little leverage uh, ordinary people have within our economic system comes from their ability to organize in the workplace. Uh, and if you don't even, you know, if, if that's even that isn't there, right? then you're really in trouble, right? I mean, I kind of start thinking about, um, you know, pretentious reference, I know, but run with me, you know, I start thinking about like in the late Roman Republic when, you know, big landed estates, you know, bought up like most of the uh, small farms and so you had all these people who were small farmers who were living in Rome and, uh, and as, as paupers and just living on like the daily bread ration, you know, like that's kind of what I think of sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'll just mention in favor of Thomas Paine once again in that regard, that Paine would never have even come to, to the American colonies in 1775. It had not been for the fact that when he had been working, he was actually working for the, for the government at the time. He was an excise officer. Where, yeah. And this was a very low paid, highly dangerous position. And his fellow excise officers knew of his talent with words, hearing him recite poetry, perhaps in a pub, something like that. And they asked him if he would actually lead a campaign to petition the government and the excise commission to raise the wages of the excise officers. And in his courageous foolishness, he said yes. And he went off to London. He wrote a petition, a five page petition on, you know, the needs of the case of the excise officers. Now this, by the way, was utterly illegal, not just because he left his post more, even more significantly, any notion of, of combining in the form of labor agitation and a labor union was utterly illegal. So here he is in London petitioning and lobbying. And eventually, he, by the way, met a lot of very important people, all of whom embraced him. But the government was outraged. And they fired him, or as the English say, they sacked him. And he basically had, he, he had become friendly with Benjamin Franklin, who spent a good deal of his own life in London. And Franklin said, you know, maybe it's time. You have an interest in America. Maybe it's time you go over to America. So in <laughs> essence, he, he got, he's the, he's the labor organizer or labor unionist who gets sacked and decides he's going to start a revolution, you might say. So 